30. Okay, so members, you're very welcome to um, the committee meeting. Um, I welcome to Trevor and Pat and Doug, who are here in the room with myself. And welcome uh, Trevor Clark, who is on the phone system with us at the moment. Uh, we will just check with anybody when we hear beeps if they join in uh, to work out who's there. I just remind everybody that we are being recorded and being broadcast. Um, and just to advise members to be careful about using mobile devices. Um, so, just to move to apologies, the clerk has received apologies from uh, George Robinson at this stage. And I can welcome Christopher into the room. And uh, I think we've just heard some beeps on the phone there. So, can I check if we have another member joining us on the phone there? That was me, Emma. Hello, Emma, you're very welcome. Um, Okay, so... Sorry, Chair Martina has just uh, texted me looking for the number. <laughs> oh. Eagle send it now. I'm sending it in here, Pat. Okay. Oh, excellent. Sending. Okay, so that will... So we'll put Martina down. We'll, we'll add Martina to the list and she'll get the number to be able to join in. Okay, so if we want to start with the uh, draft minutes from last week, and members, they are at page five of the meeting pack that's available there. Um, can I ask members if you are content that it's a true reflection of the meeting from last week? Okay, Great. so we can sign that. And pass those over to yourself. Um, so, if we go to matters arising, um, just to remind members that um, we did write to the department requesting formal notification of the position with regard to the victim's payment scheme. Now, we were, that was due to be open for applications on the 31st of May. So, that deadline has now passed and the committee hasn't received a response. Now, I have to say that I'm a bit disappointed about, um, first of all, the principle of us asking for information and not getting a response. I will always eternally be unhappy um, at that. But I am a bit sort of unhappy because this is a scheme, regardless of the politics of the scheme, the bill was introduced um, in Westminster and the scheme was actually due to be making payments. Um, at this stage, and we haven't even received notification from the department that they're, and from the executive that they aren't able to operate the scheme. And given that we're the committee that um, is to scrutinise the work of the executive, um, I think that it would have been um, sort of fairly basic uh, protocol to have inform us if they were going to breach uh, a statutory deadline, uh, and maybe even to offer us are there new time scales, are there new timetables. Um, is there a different way that the system is going to be delivered? Um, you know, it's important uh, within the checks and balances of, of the system of government that we have here that there is the executive office that will take its decisions and we're supposed to hold those to account. They didn't offer the information and we wrote to them and asked for it and they didn't come back to us on that. So that is exceptionally disappointing. And what I would ask um, maybe if, with members' agreement, is that we seek an urgent oral briefing from the department on exactly where we are uh, in this process. And I'll open that maybe to members if they want to, to comment. Chair, sure, I, I mean, I think you're absolutely right. We do, we do now because things are moving on at pace, and 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 there is a there, there is now a political aspect to this that maybe wasn't there before. Because I remember asking the question of the First and Deputy First Minister when they were here giving evidence, and I asked, were you still united in delivering this? And they said yes, but, but I'm now getting the sense that it's not. And, 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 it, and it's fine, and we know the reasons probably why it's not, but they told us that wasn't the problem, but, but it clearly is. Uh, and everybody will have different views on this, and of course Sinn Féin will have a different view, from us we will have a different view, but I think we do need to understand <clears throat> the real problems here. Because as far as I'm concerned, they told us there was no issue when I asked the question if they were united in delivering this, and they said they were, but they clearly aren't. So I think you're, I absolutely support um, asking for an oral briefing so we know exactly where we are. Okay. Um, Pat and Trevor Pat. Well, well first of all, uh, we're committed to delivering uh, for victims. <coughs> Make no uh, mistake about that. Uh, and I think everybody is united in that. 
However, the scheme that has been designed uh, and legislated for by Westminster has serious design, design faults within it, and that uh, there are serious problems around eligibility and who can actually make a claim for a payment. On top of that, there is the issue about who is going to resource this. And we could, we could actually end up in a situation, uh, theoretically anyway, where a, a regional assembly is making the payment for what some would call a national uh, scheme. And that's, that's just unheard of. Uh, this has never happened before, uh, as far as I'm aware. And I mean, I've spoken before about the cost of the PSNI hearing loss claims. At the minute, the payout is in the region of between 160 and 180 million. Now, for this particular scheme, and I think it was Judith, Judith Thompson who said this when she was in, although I could stand corrected on that, but it, it, it was someone who was here giving evidence, must have been before the lockdown, uh, and they said that. In theory, every single British soldier who served here during the conflict could potentially uh, lodge a claim for a pain. Sorry, someone wants to get their... Yeah. Their we can hear a conversation going on there somewhere, so if people could just make sure that their phones are muted, please. Thank you. Go ahead, Pat. So, uh, there are... Uh, Serious design faults in this. Uh, the British government have strayed completely away from the Stormont House Agreement uh, and, and previous legacy agreements. So, uh, you know, we, we all want to do what's right for victims, and all of us know victims well. You're very deserving of, of, of a payment. But uh, the important thing is, is to get it right. Yeah. Trevor? Correct, Yes, okay. I'll take. Yeah, we'll go on ahead. Um, well, Trevor Long had indicated before no, no, you, but no, he's no, happy no. to give way to you, Trevor, if you yeah. wish to come in. For what it's worth, I would agree with some of what Pat has said in relation to the money aspect of this. But just for the record, um, certainly myself and the party are con uh, actually happy enough with the conditions of those who uh, can avail of the scheme. I think it's right and proper that someone who was injured at the hands of their own uh, device shouldn't be ever be in receipt of any payment in terms of pension. But there is certainly concerns around, around uh, how the government came to the figure and are not stumbling up some money to pay for it. I appreciate the contributions, but I, I, I'm very careful. I don't want to stray into the, the scheme. Very much what I'm creating here is the fact that this, the scheme, regardless of what, whether people have issues or concerns, we haven't even been told that the scheme isn't due to operate. We, as a committee that scrutinises the work of the Executive Office, have effectively found out about this delay through the newspapers. And w w on that I, issue... I, I, I accept your saying, but yeah. you allow the other member to stay in I, 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 I was... I would, Trevor, I was ca I'm capturing both of you there, uh, but you were the one that wanted to come in before I got the chance to, to offer that. But it, it, it's in reference to everybody. Uh, that certainly wasn't singling you out. Uh, Trevor Long? No, I, I would just say move on, Chair. We're getting to work. Um, we're be being heavily castigated for not getting this scheme up and running. Uh, but we're having almost a political discussion again there, and it's not, it's <coughs> not worth it. The only thing I would query, do, do we know for sure which, which department, which committee is going to be responsible for overseeing this scheme if it does get going? Because I, I thought I read somewhere recently that, uh, that Westminster had asked... They said, that's a sticking point. We don't know who to be talking to. Is, that, is there any truth in that? Well, we haven't been informed of that and we haven't read it in the papers yet, but maybe if we could <laughs> actually get the oral briefing, we might be able to find out what the department's actually doing, which they believe is our, our role. So, yeah. uh, again, that's the, the purpose of maybe asking for the oral briefing is that we can get some of the information up front rather than, than by second hand. So are, are members happy enough if we seek that oral briefing? Okay. Yes. Yep. Yeah, okay. I'm t I'm t I'll take that as an agreement. Okay. Thank you, um, members. Secondly, then at last week's uh, meeting, um, one of the lead officials uh, from the executive um, told us that the work of the officials preparing for Brexit was hampered by the relocation and diversion of staff to deal with coronavirus. Um, now, 
staff dealing with coronavirus is entirely understandable and acceptable. Um, he did suggest that um, we are therefore not in a state of preparedness uh, to be able to get ready for Brexit and the impact that it could have. So I would therefore think that um, subsequent to the vote of the House that we had yesterday, I believe that it is critical that our executive uh, do not rush in uh, to complete a Brexit or be part of a Brexit deal uh, that is going to be detrimental to our business community and to the various sectoral interests that we have in the North, who, in fairness amongst all of them, are almost in unison in suggesting that a delay to the an extension to the transition period no, would, be right the uh, would be preferable. Would be preferable in enabling uh, there to be a proper uh, outcome that works for everybody. So I am therefore going to propose that we write to the First and Deputy First Minister and state that our position as a committee, that was no reference to uh, positions on Brexit, that an extension to the transition period is reasonably sa reasonable, sensible and in the best interests of the people that we serve. And I would make that proposal. Chair, you can, you can propose that and I have no doubt that there are the numbers on this committee to pass that. But it will, and if you send that letter, you may choose to do so. I can't speak for Doug, but I know the position that the Ulster Unionists took yesterday. What you will be doing is sending a letter uh, to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister that has only the support of Nationalists and the independent member of this committee. I never know. Similarly, similarly uh, yesterday in the Assembly it was hailed uh, as the, the result that it was. This place is supposed to be governed by the principle of dual consent, two communities moving forward together. Not a single Unionist member, to the best of my knowledge, voted for the motion that passed the Assembly yesterday. So I have no doubt you can command a majority on this committee to send such a letter, but I would expect that letter to detail that it did not have the support of either the DUP or the Ulster Unionists. Can I, okay. can I just add to that, please? Um, I know last week we had a very brief conversation about this uh, and, and that you were talking about bringing it forward. And I did say that it's worthwhile speaking to all of the members um, uh, uh, beforehand so, so they all understood where you were going. Can I just ask, did you do that or, or did you omit speaking to some of them, such as the DUP members? Um, I spoke to the people that uh, I knew the responses that I was going to get. I, think, I don't think it would be any shock, the response that I just got from Christopher, to be fair. And given that yesterday in the House, I think it was a fair, the party has articulated very clearly its views. And, and I don't think we're, we're going to change or turn that. And, 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 and that's a fair one. And, and in that case, and I have to be the same with, and, and say the same as Christopher, because there's something slightly insidious, is if the only people you speak to are the people who think we will support you without trying to bring other people along with you. Um, I would ask um, that you delay putting forward that for a week till next Wednesday to have the ability to talk to all of the members um, so they understand the intention of what you're trying to do as opposed to putting that forward now. Because having just said that because they don't support it, I'm, I'm not going to talk to you about it. It's just not, it's just, it's just not a great way to, to, to run a, a committee, to be honest. Any other views? Uh, well, I, I would support your proposal. It's no big surprise to Christopher. And uh, I just I just wonder where we're going with all this, frankly. This this country, and I mean the UK, is going to hell in a handcart if, if we don't get an extension. There is no way this can be properly prepared and put together between now and the end of December. And we may not even get the chance to take it that far the way things are going. And you've got a Prime Minister who's behaving like his head in the sand to get, get Brexit done, you know, you just, that's not the way you do business. And we're talking business here, it's not entirely politics. Business out there is, is turning their hair out, worrying how they're going to manage this situation. And they, listen, listen to it, you know, we've talked about the Road Haulage Association before, but they're right in the firing line. It's really serious stuff, and I don't understand. I heard yesterday during the debate people talking about the obstinacy and the... Uh, an immovable attitude of the European Union. I, it takes two. I don't. I don't see much movement from the British government or much response. I think they're just they're just running down the clock and are prepared to let the thing. And not use bad language, but really, it, it, it's getting to such a serious stage now. I just do not understand this attitude. That uh, no, I can't contemplate an extension. Any businessman out there. 
and any thinking politician, frankly, would take that view. Martina, yeah. uh, Martina, are you looking in there from the phones? Yes, Chair, and look, I can understand that we're not going to get the support of everyone on the committee. But if the committee was going to have to operate on us all having to get 100% support from each other or all the political parties, then we probably wouldn't be able to move too far. And like any other committee, if you have to put it to a vote, so be it. But this is an issue. We only have four weeks, whilst there's seven months left uh, before we could potentially go over a cliff. We only have four weeks before the joint committee um, we'll make a decision if required, if asked to do so, if requested to do so for an extension. So the clock is ticking and we're going into a potential emergency. So I can understand, and we heard yesterday, the views of the parties who objected to an extension to the transition period. Uh, respect those views. Those are the views of the two parties, but it cannot, uh, I think, hamper the majority of the committee from asking that the executive takes such a decision. Okay, anybody else from the phones that wishes to contribute? Okay, uh, I'll move to motion. And I just want to also make a point. I think about three or four occasions um, that I've asked questions in this committee and in the House and again here today, and I've been exceptionally clear, and, and I hope uh, that members will, will accept this, to always try to depoliticise by saying that this is not being put forward in the interest of politics or political gain. It has clearly been put forward in the sense that all the lobbying that comes from various sectors is saying that we fear that we're not ready and we want to have a, a, a delay uh, to the implementation. And that is uniquely across everything. There is no sector that has come running saying, please, we absolutely want this to happen in the next few weeks. Please do not. It is without distinction in that. And it's in that point that I don't make it as a, a political point to people because I respect the fact that people are permitted to have, obviously, their own views. And I entirely respect that. And this is not a decision that's been taken to try and champion one view over another. It is being a very practical, very pragmatic, listening to people that are very, very fearful, very frightened and very scared about their businesses and their future. And it's on that basis that I make the proposal which is that given the unique impact on Brexit and Northern Ireland and the impact of the ongoing COVID-19 pandemic, the Committee for the Executive Office writes to the First Minister and Deputy First Minister asking that the Executive calls on the UK Government to request an extension to the current Brexit transition period beyond the 31st of De December 2020. Chair, could I just say, if you weren't making a political point, I would be disappointed. This is a room full of politicians. This is a political institution. So, of course, it's a political point. How can it not be? Uh, the fact is that the Assembly voted the way the Assembly voted yesterday. And I respect that outcome. I disagree with it, but I respect that outcome. But let us not pretend that you're not making a political point. You're a politician. If you weren't making a political point, you would be failing in your job. So, you know, let's not try to dress this up as something other than that which it is. Now, as I said, you, I have no doubt, can carry a majority on this committee for your proposal, and if you proceed to a vote, will do so. But I would expect the content of the letter to reflect the fact that not a single Unionist member of this committee gave their assent for such a letter to be sent, just as, to the best of my knowledge, I haven't checked the Hansard, but to the best of my knowledge, not a single Unionist member of the Assembly voted for the proposal yesterday. But you are the chair of the committee. And if you want to write to FM and DFM, I assume FM and DFM are aware of the way that the Assembly voted yesterday. So whether or not writing actually adds anything is, is beyond me. But I would expect your letter to reflect the fact that no unionist on this committee supported the proposal. Clerk, and then I'll come to... If we do go to a vote and a letter is issued, we can put in the... I think that's fair the enough. As long as, long as the, the impression should not be conveyed that this is a committee, uh, a combined collective committee position, because it's not. It's a majority position on this committee, which is something very different. Okay. Well, I suppose without coming between the two of you in this uh, dispute, I, I would have to say that I agree with the chair in terms of 
practically every sector out there in society uh, is uh, particularly concerned about Brexit, especially in the context of us being in the middle of, of this pandemic. Uh, and I think it would be wrong of us on the committee not to reflect that view within this committee. Uh, you know, so for that reason, uh, I would support the chair. Uh, I, I think we should represent views that, first of all, are made to us as public representatives and political parties. But secondly, you know, people are out in the media every day about this, people from every single sector that I can gather. If there's a significant sector out there that isn't lobbying, I haven't heard them, uh, and, and I don't know if anyone else has. Okay, but for great, and I will, I will just, I'll finish finally by saying I hope once again that Christopher understands that what I meant by the term of not being political about this is that I was not trying to be triumphant about it, nor trying to be party political about it. I'm just trying to think of a sectoral interest, but we shall leave it there, and we'll put it to the vote. I think it will require. Right, yeah. Yeah. So, um, you, you want to run through the list or just add for. We need the proposal. The proposal is read out there. There's somebody to well, second. Do you want me to read the proposal again? No, I'm happy to second it. Yeah. Okay. You're okay. So, we have eyes, please. Okay. Colin. Pat. Aye. Trevor. <laughs> Aye. Martina. A nose. No. I am on the there. Yep. Yeah. Okay. I'll just confirm. So the eyes we have: Colin McGrath, Trevor Lunn, Martina Anderson, Pat Sheehan, Emma Sheeran. The nose we have: Doug Beatty, Trevor Clark, Christopher Stalford, and George Robinson is absent. That's fine. Okay. And just to confirm, the letter will issue. Um, to FM, DFM as outlined in the proposal and uh, in that letter will include details of the division. Okay. Right, members, thank you very much for that. We can move on then to item four on the agenda, which is the June 2020 monitoring round, the departmental um, oral evidence. So, members, on page 12 of your meeting pack, we have the relevant papers. Um, which doesn't include the papers from the department, as once again we have a series of papers that have not been made available to us to be able to consider. Um, it will certainly make uh, it all the more important to listen to the briefing that we get because we don't have anything that we can actually uh, scrutinise uh, in terms of written form. Uh, apparently ministers are still considering the June monitoring proposals and therefore no briefing paper can be finalised and provided for us for today's meeting. Uh, there is a, the committee did consider a raised briefing paper and monitoring rounds at our meeting on the 20th of May and agreed to forward a copy to the Executive Office asking for a response to the re relevant scrutiny points. Uh, to date, to say uh, a response has not been received. The raised paper uh, can be found at page 14 of the meeting pack. Um, and you may wish to refer to that and the issues that are contained into it whenever we are asking some questions of um, the officials. Um, the departmental uh, briefing will be through teleconferencing, and I can take this opportunity to welcome Mark Brown and Tara Kennedy. Uh, Mark, as we know, is the Director of Strategic Policy, Quality and Good Relations in the Executive Office, and Tara is the head of the Finance Branch. So. Um, I'll pass over to yourselves then to give us um, a briefing, uh, which we will use to scrutinise in the absence of the written paper. Then uh, pass over to yourself, Mark. Thank you very much, Chair. And uh, can I apologise for the fact that the, the committee uh, uh, doesn't have a written paper? As you explained, and, and we sent a, a, a message um, before the committee meeting just to indicate that. The deadline for returns uh, on June monitoring set by the Department of Finance is this Friday, the 5th of June, uh, and ministers are still uh, considering a number of proposals uh, in the June monitoring uh, paper that we've provided to them. Um, so on some of those, they're, they're, they're still under consideration and agreement has to be reached on them. 
Um, but they have advised that I can uh, brief the committee on uh, the generality of, of the issues that we face in June monitoring. I appreciate that without a paper, it can be difficult to follow figures, so um, I will try and take this through um, as, as clearly as I can. Um, and uh, afterwards, of course, Tara and I will be happy to answer any questions the, the committee has. Perhaps uh, if I could start with <clears throat> the opening position in 2020-21. Um, our, our resource Dell opening allocation at the start of the year was some 113 uh, 0.5 million pounds. That comprised a number of elements. It comprised our baseline of 57.8 million, uh, central funds, executive central funds of 15.5 million, uh, and ring fenced funds uh, of 37.5 million for HIA and 2.7 million for EU future relations. So that gave us 113.5 million at the start of the year. Um, in terms of the executive central funds of 15.5 million, they were broken down across 2.8 million for uh, delivering social change projects, 0.7 million for Atlantic Philanthropies co-funded projects, and uh, 12 million of the shared future funds that support the Together Building a United Community uh, strategy. Um, in the course of the of, of the uh, discussions around. Um, Budget 2020-21. Um, we made bids for the HIA of 38.9 million, and, and 37.5 million was allocated, as I've mentioned. We made a bid of 2.9 million for EU future relations in terms of work on Brexit, uh, and 2.7 million was allocated. So that's that's where we started this year in terms of our allocations, and that's the breakdown of our budget. So in terms of June monitoring, we had to consider um, a range of things. Um, First of all, uh, were there any easements across the department or, or arm tank bodies? And secondly, what pressures uh, would have emerged? So <clears throat> um, in terms of easements, there were easements of uh, £100,000 uh, that were identified, uh, and there were pressures of £1.2 million identified across the department as arm tank bodies. Uh, those pressures uh, related to um, 0.7 million in the department for staff costs uh, across a range of areas, uh, 0.1 million for MDNA costs, uh, 0.3 million from arm length bodies, um, and 0.1 million to support the uh, creation of the mental health champion, uh, which all departments are contributing to. So those elements made up the pressures of 1.2 uh, million, against which we had easements of 0.1 million which left us with a net pressure of 1.1 million pounds. Now, the other, in, in, in seeking to address that pressure, um, we have some sources of income in the department, and the most significant is the uh, income that we derive from financial transactions capital. Under the arrangements, uh, the interest-bearing loans that are made uh, through TEO and through the, social, uh, the Strategic Investment Board um, to, uh, in, in most cases, it's the, it's the University of Ulster, but also the Northern Ireland Investment Fund. Um, they have in, they are interest bearing, and a certain proportion of that can be retained by the department. Um, so, some 70 million uh, investment was made to the Northern Ireland Investment Fund, which meant that there was 2.2 million of interest uh, available to TEO as a consequence of that. So, putting that 2.2 million. Um, um, against the, um, the pressure we had uh, from our, our normal baseline of 700,000, um, left us with a balance of 1.5 million uh, available to deal with the pressures that emerged in June monitoring of 1.1 million. Um, <clears throat> so, so, so we have 1.5 million uh, uh, against 1.1 million. Um, there are, of course, some other emerging uh, pressures. Uh, emerging from uh, uh, other departmental responsibilities. So for one such emerging pressure, for example, is the Northern Ireland Hub, which TEO uh, hosts on behalf of all departments. Um, and uh, TEO bid for uh, four million pounds uh, for that in, uh, at the start of the year. Um, and the pressure, uh, now that we're further into the year and that we're clearer, um, is is 3.2 million. Um, so what we are proposing uh, to do 
um, is to use funds of half a million from the Santley Health Fund for anticipated emerging pressures to offset that pressure. Uh, and that will leave a net pressure of £2.7 million, pounds, uh, which we will bid for as part of the uh, centrally uh, run reprioritisation exercise. So, so basically what I'm saying is uh, we had um, £2.2 million of interest available. Um, we had £1.1 uh, million of pressures. We had £700 million from our, our, our baseline to meet. Uh, and, and what we're proposing to do is to put 500 uh, towards the central pressures uh, that are emerging to meet the 700 and hold uh, the remainder against the the, the pressures that have, the other pressures that have emerged in um, in June monitoring. In terms of um, capital, um, we have a, a baseline of 18.1 million pounds. And there the position is quite different in that this has been fairly significantly impacted by COVID-19. Uh, work on a number of the capital projects has had to stop, um, although, although a number have now come back on site uh, with appropriate social distancing. But spend has been reduced there. And so uh, in the non-ring fence capital, we have an easement of £2 million, um, which is offset by a few bids from within the department. So we have a net easement of 1.8 million that we will be making available to uh, the Department of Finance centrally. Um, in terms of ring fence capital, Dale, which has to be used for the purposes, for, for specific purposes, there's an easement of 1.4 million. This relates to the Social Investment Fund and again is due to delays that are arising from the impact on the construction sector uh, of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we will make an easement of 1.4 million on ring fenced uh, Dale. So, Chair, that's, that's our current uh, position. Um, we believe that, that we can um, meet the pressures that, are, uh, ha that have emerged uh, internally uh, and that we can put half a million towards pressures uh, that we had bid for centrally, um, but in line with what DOF asked us to do, to ask departments to look internally to see what uh, pressures they could meet themselves. We believe we can meet half a million uh, of those pressures that are coming largely from the COVID-19 and from the hub, uh, and that should leave us uh, able to meet our responsibilities uh, going forward. So, I, I was going to pause there, and I, I know you referenced the, uh, the raised scrutiny points, uh, and I'm happy to take any questions on, on those. Um, if, if, if members want to raise them, or indeed on any other issue uh, associated with what, what I've just outlined to the committee. Okay, uh, Mark, thank, thank you very much for that, and, and I appreciate it's not your fault that there's no paper that's available, but just again to underscore, it's very difficult. That's uh, a lot of numbers thrown at us in, in different ways, and I tried to scribble as best I could there, but um, there comes a point whenever it's just uh, it's tough to do that. Um, I maybe just would have two questions to open with. I suppose the first is you did mention in there about there being a bid for a COVID hub, which you're kind of um, hosting on behalf of the uh, other departments within the executive. W what would happen if that bid's unsuccessful? Well, that, that, uh, that is uh, part of the considerations that we will have with the uh, Department of Finance. Um, those, the, 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 hub, the, the cost of the hub we are starting to reduce uh, as the need for that sort of central coordination um, is being reduced uh, as the, the pandemic uh, uh, progresses. Um, so the costs there are, are changing. Um, but nevertheless, those remain a pressure for us. And if we weren't able to uh, absorb some of those pressures, uh, as, well, the first thing is that we'll bid for it. If we don't get the bid, we'll have to look at how we can absorb it. Uh, from other budgets. That could mean reductions uh, across a range of, of budget areas, but we will have to um, look at that and make a, a return to the Department of Finance on that. And you're probably aware that the, uh, the finance uh, uh, minister has made it clear that um, in responding to, to, to committees, that second element of the exercise in terms of what we will do uh, to meet any further pressures is one that should await uh, decisions by the uh, executive uh, on those pressures. So I can't really go into any more detail on that other than to say that if it's not met, we'll have to try and find some savings across the range of our departmental uh, functions. Okay, my final question really then is, um, if I heard you correctly during your presentation there, 
there were a number of pressures that you had identified um, that you were using the money that you were saving during the year to kind of offset it before then working out what was left at the end to hand back. So are you identifying a couple of your budget lines that are extending beyond what is actually being uh, allocated to them? Um, is that something that you have maybe like an internal process to examine to see that whenever it comes to next year, do you need to bid for more money uh, rather than just going for the same budget? Or h how do you kind of manage that if a project is suddenly going to require an extra million pounds or two million pounds? I mean, what sort of mechanisms do you have in place to check why that's the case? Well, there, there, there's a number of, of ways in which we first, first of all, we scrutinize any, any bids, both internal and external. Um, to uh, I mean from one of the bodies um, as to what the, the, the cost drivers are um, and to uh, uh, what the, what the outcomes are and what the, the, the necessity is and we would prioritize those um, according to whether or not they're their PFG commitments or whether they're ministerial commitments or whether they're statutory requirements um, in terms of where the pressures have come from and how we deal with them a, a number of these have come from additional work that has come to the uh, department over the course of the last number of years, <coughs> um, some of which has not been funded and some of which was identified, for example, in the new decade, new uh, uh, approach. Um, and uh, some also like the mental health champion contribution is a cross-departmental contribution, which the executive has uh, agreed on. So for those, we have to look at uh, whether we have um, any um, potential or available funding in, in existing budgets or any source of income. In this case, we are fortunate in that the work that we do in the financial transactions capital generates that income, uh, which relates to the interest uh, 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 coming from the loans that go through TEO, through the Strategic Investment Board, and on out to uh, the, um, the sector for specific projects. Um, Doug, yourself then? Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, uh, thank you, Mark, for, for that, um, and Tara uh, for being with us. Uh, I mean, it, incredibly difficult to, to, to follow that, if I'm really honest, and, and um, I'm more inclined to wait to see the, the whole figures coming out uh, come come the 5th. But, but what you did you did mention, Mark, was the, um, the, the new decade, new approach. Costings has been set aside for that. I didn't quite pick up on the figure. But could you extrapolate that a little bit? How much are we, we talking about in regards to budget required for the Office of Identity and Culture uh, and the three new commissioners, that's the two language commissioners, uh, and the Armed Forces Commissioner, which is coming in, and, and that's budgeted, or is it bid for, or do you have that funding already? Um, there was no budget um, identified for NDNA, and therefore there's no budget that's been made available to the department to take forward that uh, area of work. What we have been able to do is to look within our own uh, resources and we prioritize to put staff to do some of the work in, in preparation for or to prepare the, 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 the policy uh, and to work on the legislation uh, associated with this and to start to think about the sort of structures that need to be put in place, including the Office of Identity and Cultural Expression and of course the two language commissioners. Um, but the um, we will have to bid uh, for the costs um, of those institutions uh, when, when they're actually set up. We, our budget wouldn't be able to stretch uh, to meet those costs. In terms of what those costs actually are, apart from the staffing costs that, uh, in the department we are currently covering ourselves, um, we haven't actually put a firm figure on it. Um, at one stage, you may recall, we had talked about looking at other similar type organisations and putting a ballpark figure, but I think uh, our thinking is moving on to uh, really, um, when the legislation is, is, is moving through and uh, has been approved, to um, making a, a small number of appointments uh, and asking then uh, uh, the head of the Office of Identity, Culture uh, and Cultural Expression and the individual uh, language commissioners to identify what resources they think they need to fulfil their functions uh, and the department can then respond to that and that will give a clearer costing. So I don't have a clear costing on that, uh, Doug. I think. We, th we think it makes more sense, as I say, to put the early stages in, 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 in place and then seek views from those who are implementing what they think is required and to respond to that. No, Mark, that makes absolute sense. Um, and thanks for sharing that. And, and uh, I have no issue with that answer at all. 
But could you, you did mention there was, a, there was a, an amount of money that was set aside for the new, new decade, new approach. Um, how much have you had to find from your own existing budget uh, uh, during this monitoring round to, to do the preparatory work that you just talked about? What number, what, what figure are we talking about just at the moment? Well, I think at, at the moment we have identified costs of, of about uh, 0.1 uh, million of uh, pressure. But that wouldn't be uh, indicative of the full costs that we're actually meeting, uh, Doug, because there would be uh, staff working on new deck and new approach um, um, issues uh, in, in existing branches. So I, I would have to actually look at what those costs would, would be. But the pressure that's coming is 0.1. Thank you. Okay, Christopher. Thank you, and uh, thank you for the information that you were able to give us, sort of limited as it is. Um, in terms of the, there was an earlier discussion at the committee about the pension scheme for victims of the troubles, and I'm just wondering, is prep work being undertaken by the department, that obviously is going to bring a financial cost to the department, I'm just wondering, is prep work being undertaken within the department for the delivery of that pension scheme? Um. Yes, there, there has been work ongoing for um, some some time uh, in making the preparations for the scheme, uh, Christopher. Um, there's been uh, discussions that, that we, have, we, have a, we have a delivery team established in the executive office. Um, I chair uh, a victims' pensions oversight group, which has been meeting for well, must be over six months, uh, and has representation from a number of departments with an interest uh, in this whole area to try and take forward the various uh, preparations. So we've, we, we are working with NIJAC, we're working with um, so the, the Judicial Appointments Commission, we're working with, with I've met with the Lord Chief Justice, um, we've been discussing with the PSNI and PRONI, um, and uh, we've been doing a lot of background work uh, in preparation for the scheme. We've looked at the, um, the IT system that would be required, although we can't move on that until there's clarity over a, a designated department. Uh, so that we know who we're working with, uh, and also on this. Obviously, as you've met, you've referenced earlier in your discussion just prior to uh, our presentation, uh, there's not agreement uh, uh, yet on the source of funding and on some aspect of the guidance uh, on this. Has a budget estimate been established in terms of what that prep is likely to cost, and is there a request for some of that budget from this monitoring round? Well, the, the, that is one of the matters that is still being uh, considered by ministers, uh, Christopher, and I'm not able to, to, to go into detail uh, around that. Okay, but just, okay, well you can't give me the budget, but has a request been put in in terms of the delivery of the victims' pension scheme for funding from the June monitoring round? Well, as I say, the, the proposals haven't been finalised yet, and, and, and that, will, that will be a matter that the minister will have to decide on. Uh, what we have been doing is to look at what the total costs would be across the scheme uh, and to try and work out uh, um, uh, 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 what the profile of those costs might be. It's a very complicated uh, matter and we're still uh, 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 working on that. Uh, forgive me if I'm, if I'm not being clear. What, what I'm asking is, has, I mean, ministers make decisions, obviously, and civil servants feed suggestions up to ministers in terms of you know, Minister, this may cost X. You might want to lift some of the money out of the June monitoring round to pay for it. All I'm asking, I don't need details. All I'm asking is, has a request for funding from the June monitoring round been submitted for the prep work for the delivery of the victims' pension scheme? Um, Chris, I think that's something that ministers are currently considering, and there's no decision taken on it, so I, I can't give you an answer uh, on that. Okay. Okay, Pat. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Mark. And just just on one of those last points you were making, you were saying you're working on the costs for this particular scheme. H have there been any changes made to those costs since the last time you were speaking to the committee? Well, I think there have been a number of cost figures that we have discussed with the committee. Um, uh, and there's, there's been a figure that's got out into the media, um, which um, 
is, is not quite accurate. Um, I think when the first when the first minister came to the committee, she referred to costs in the first year of somewhere between 25 and 60 million pounds. Uh, and I came to the committee, uh, if you recall, a couple of meetings ago, and we were talking about the estimates uh, uh, document. And at that stage, I mentioned a figure of 109 million pounds, which was for the first three years, uh, and included some backdating costs and lump sum costs. Uh, but neither of those were the full cost of the scheme. Um, and, and it seems to be in, in the media, the notion is there that it's £100 million pounds is the total cost of the scheme. Uh, that, that is a confusion, I think, with the £109 million figure that I referred to, which we reckon to be the costs that we could concur in the first three years of the scheme. In terms of the total costs, Pat, it's, it's, it's quite complicated, and there's a number of areas where we haven't got firm figures, so we're still working through uh, what those numbers might be and what the costs might be and how many might come forward. There's a lot of variables there, and I'm not in a position yet to identify uh, what a range of total costs might yet be. And the complexity of it all, and uh, I'm, I'm familiar with the figure of £109 million for the first three years, but I'm, I'm right in saying this is potentially a 30-year scheme? Well, for, uh, this payment will extend for the duration of the lives of, of um, the people who are uh, uh, beneficiaries uh, of it, and indeed, in some case, cases, um, their, their partners. Um, although there's also the option, of course, for some to take uh, uh, 10 years as a, a lump sum up front. But yes, it could extend for, for uh, a long period. Uh, I don't have a precise figure, but it could be in some cases for some victims, it could be uh, 30 years of payments. And, and potentially, uh, you know, apart from, uh, you know, everyone who lives here in the north uh, who, who was a victim and could potentially make a claim, it would also be the case that every uh, member of the British Army who served here over that uh, around 30 year period could potentially also make a claim. That would be the case, wouldn't it? Well, uh, uh, allowance would have to be made for any other pension that um, people in that category had, had uh, uh, been eligible for. Uh, they would have to claim and make uh, uh, their eligibility uh, or, or be seen as eligible. And it may be more likely that it could be their survivors were they to pass away that would be the beneficiaries. And, and if that category of people w uh, were to be excluded, it's also the case that uh, others who have served a prison sentence of more than two years or have been sentenced to more than two years imprisonment are also excluded. Well, I, th I think there, there you're getting into the guidance um, around um, the, the, the exceptions, and that hasn't been finalised yet, um, Pat, so I think that's, that's something that's still under consideration, still under discussion. But can I just to, sorry? sorry I, I, just I, I, I let you I, I let you go with point because it's about the June monitoring round. Just in case the officers come back to say you're asking questions about something beyond what we were here today, but I'll let you continue to make points if you need to. And, and, and just as final point, and I already made it earlier. And so far as uh, you know, if the responsibility for administering this scheme uh, was lumped on to the <coughs> executive here, it would essentially be a regional assembly uh, administering what some people would term a national scheme. Uh, are, are you familiar with any other uh, similar scheme like that? Um, I think, well, it's, I think that's a difficult question for me to answer, uh, uh, Pat, without, without uh, being able to work my way through it. Um, so I think I'd prefer not to answer that. I'm not sure. Um, okay, I'm going to go to the phones to the order that people uh, join the conversation just to ask them if they have any questions. So, Trevor Clark, I think you were on the phones first. Do you have any questions? Sometimes it can be a little delay if people are following it on the. <laughs> we have to fill in with a little song. <laughs> a little bit of elevator music. I don't think we have, Trevor, then maybe a try with Emma. You were on next. Do you have any questions? I don't know. Perfect. And then finally, Martina, do you have any questions? Yes, please. Yes, go on ahead. Thank you. Thank you. 
Um, it's even more difficult when you're in over the phone to try and capture all the, the figures that was just given. And I, I share the, um, the frustration of others of trying to do this uh, in this manner without a paper. Um, you mentioned that you had bid for 2.9 million um, for post Brexit or Brexit pressures. Could you outline? Uh, I know you said, I think you said you got 2.7 million of an allocation. Could you explain to us what that's been used for? Um, <clears throat> yes, um, that, that's been used for. Um, a range of pressures. Maybe it just Tara's just maybe just going to pick up on that. Right. Um, yeah. So there's. Yeah. Um, sorry, we've got an echo here. Every time my gap is now. Um, yes. Yeah, so there's 2.7 million. So the majority of it is for staff costs, and then we have some for general administration. But the majority of that 2.7 million um, will go towards staff costs. Is that additional staff that you're bringing in, or I'm just trying to work out um, that this, you know, where the new pressure has come for, from? Have you been as a for training staff? Uh, what staff going to be doing that they will, maybe wouldn't have been doing before? Have you the employ other staff? Or? There's, there's no new pressure now. Um, we received um, money last year, and this is money for this year. Yeah. And and what's what's the what's the staff uh, role? What's the role the jobs the staff will be doing around Brexit, just so that we can have a handle as to what the staff will be doing there, so that we know when we're scrutinising what kind of questions we should be asking based on the agreement of the staff. Yeah, the the the, the two point seven million I referred to was was the funding that was made available centrally to support. Yeah, right. Um, our, 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 our work on this. It's part, we, we, we had bid for money last year and we got money last year, so that, that, that is this year's uh, element of that. It's not, it's not a pressure, Martina, it's something that's been in, in our oh. baseline. I was explaining that, and I appreciate you haven't got a paper in front of you, but no. I was just explaining what the, 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 the opening allocation had been. So this is to support the whole um, team that is um, advising ministers on the negotiations that is helping to coordinate all the preparations across all the uh, departments and to try to interpret what the, the potential implications are of the various proposals that have come forward. So it's, it's the ongoing cost of the, the Brexit team uh, from, from previous years. It's, it's not a new pressure. It's the ongoing cost. Okay. And is there any uh, support being given to outreach engagement with the multitude of different sectors who are deeply concerned about what's coming down the track at them. I mean, like Brexit is happening, uh, we know that, but given that um, a number of uh, organisations are not prepared for the implications of the border in the REC, so is any staff outreaching to particular business sectors or others so that they would be informed around the kind of decorations that would be expected, what's the kind of FAT system, two FAT systems in place, how would that actually operate? And I mean, have ministers been kept across that? Do ministers understand uh, the scale of this, given that there is a support team to help coordinate the pressures across the departments? Mm -hmm. Well, I, I, I think for, for a more detailed answer, uh, we need to get someone from the Brexit team uh, to speak to you. I know they were speaking to you last week, but right. in, general, in general terms, um, the, the, the role of that central uh, um, uh, uh, group is to uh, be, uh, be to follow the negotiation, to follow the proposals, and to coordinate across departments uh, what the impact of those proposals might be, and to work with those departments to ensure that the sort of contacts you're talking about, the sort of awareness raising and the sort of consideration of issues that you're talking about is picked up by departments uh, uh, and then is relayed back both the individual ministers uh, and to uh, the First and Deputy First Minister and the uh, executive. Okay, no problem. Okay, thank you very thank much. You. Thank you. And I'll just do a final check just in case if Trevor Clark is there, maybe might have exited, but just, uh, okay, I think he's not there. Okay, um, so thank Sorry, you. Sir, could I just ask one last question about the capital spend? And yes, of course, yeah, one, yeah, of course. Um, I think there was an easement um, mark of 1.8 or 1.9 million on, yes. the, on the capital funding. 
um, due to projects having to stop due to COVID. What, what projects were those? Have you any idea? Um, there were a number of those in the urban village uh, uh, side um, that, that have been delayed. Um, so, uh, in fact, there were some that we had hoped would spend towards the end of last year that we weren't able to spend, and then there's been there will be a general delay uh, across a whole all the, the, the virtually all the capital projects uh, next year because of the social distancing and the extra time things things are going to take. So I think it's a full swathe of urban village projects. Some but some specific ones, for example, last year um, we had to the, the, there was the, the town park in Collins. We just started work on that, um, and it had to be delayed. Now it would spend something like two or three hundred pounds, uh, or two hundred two or three hundred thousand pounds um, uh, a month. Um, so there's been the delay there has, has kicked on. Now it's now starting up again, but there's been a delay on that. But it's just really uh, the impact of COVID across the full range of projects, both in urban villages, which is the non-ring fenced, but also in the social investment fund, which is the ring fenced. So it's just that delay and um, being able to move those projects forward. Thank you, Chair. Okay. Um, okay, so that concludes members' questions. So, um, Mark, could I ask that we get a written briefing once the ministers have finalised the proposals? And I think you're suggesting there that they need to be submitted by Friday. So, if that goes in on Friday, could we get that and then we'll be able to discuss it at next week's meeting? Uh, yes, sure. Thank you. Happy, happy to do that. Okay, thank you very much indeed. Thank you to yourself and Tara then. Thank you. Okay, thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And then, uh, members, if I could just ask then if members are uh, content to note what we've heard today or if there are any issues that we'd like to follow up on from that briefing. Can I just clarify something? And, and just for the record, because I think it needs to be put on the record, um, and, and it's through the church, just something that, that Pat said is just not correct. Not every member of the British Army who served in Northern Ireland can apply for the Victims Payment Scheme, because if they were here and they were seriously injured, they get from the Armed Forces Pension Scheme, formerly known as the War Pension Scheme. You can't get two pensions for the same injury, so they can't apply. Um, so if somebody was over here serving in the military and was seriously injured as part of the Troubles, the Ministry of Defence pay him his, his, his pension as part of the Armed Forces Pension Scheme. Okay. And I, uh, permit, I'll just, just permit, I'm going I'm to stop there because I'll permit the, 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 the clarification on a point that was been made that probably shouldn't have been made because we were discussing the June monitoring ride. I think we will get an opportunity to have these discussions again. And I think it's because we had a shorter presentation today that I was allowing a wee bit of uh, leeway. But I think we should conduct those conversations when it's an agenda item. It was a monitoring round. I was Fair given enough, leeway. But, but just, 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 just on a point of I'll make it the final point on that. And I, I was quoting a witness who gave evidence to the committee okay. who, who stated that. It may have been Judith Thompson, it may not, but it was certainly around that okay. time. Sure so, we'll and I hope we will get the opportunity to clarify these matters whenever we discuss them, uh, the issue further. Okay, members, uh, if we can move on to item five, which is the forward work plan. It's available on page 26 of the meeting pack. And just to remind members that next week we have um, Permanent Secretary and the Head of the Civil Service, David Sterling, who will be uh, along to give evidence on the functioning of Government Miscellaneous Provisions Bill. Um, so that's the update for next week. And uh, the forward work programme is a little bit shorter in detail given that we're moving towards summertime and we'll need to look at, at post that or what we're going to arrange for over summertime. But are members happy to note the forward work plan? Yes. Okay. Uh, I'm, just, just, I'm yep. just observing that the next next four meetings are all going to be spent at least in part on the function of government uh, miscellaneous provision bill. Um, I might say more if that red light wasn't on. I, th I think you're making a point towards me that should maybe be directed at Mr. Allister for for pursuing, but it's it's there, and we have obligations to uh, scrutinise the content which is relevant to the department. And I'm just remembering our starting point on this from months ago. Okay. Uh, moving on then to item six, correspondence. Um, just to inform members that in your pack there are 11 items of correspondence this week. I'm going to draw attention just to one or two. Um, one is uh, page 31 of your meeting pack. It's item 6.1, and it was a response from the First and Deputy First Minister 
uh, to the issues that were raised at an informal meeting that we had myself and it was myself just that was at that we didn't have a, a deputy chair at that stage. Um, I have to just report back in that through the correspondence to highlight that members of ministers have expressed a desire to improve communications with the committee. Um, and in so doing, I have agreed to the scheduling of quarterly appearances at the committee and regularly having informal meetings with the chair and deputy chair, um, dates of which have been identified and factored into the working programme. So I have to say uh, that definitely was something I was pleased to hear that there was a a desire to improve the communication. Um, in terms of other points, just to note, in terms of Brexit issues, Brexit has been considered at the Monday meetings of the Executive along with um, the response to the COVID-19 pandemic and other matters which may require executive agreement. Now, we have been previously told that instead of the Brexit subgroup, that specific executive meetings would have a single agenda item to focus on EU-related matters. So there has been a bit of a departure in that. And again, it's just on the grounds of scrutiny. It's difficult for us to scrutinise um, those matters if they are uh, going to be part of the overall executive meetings of which the discussions and outcomes are generally not made public. So um, just noting that, that that strays from what they told us at the meeting. In terms of the COVID-19 response, ministers have committed to providing information to the chair and committee clerk in advance of oral statements. So, in relation to the last statement, um, I received a copy at uh, 20 minutes due before the uh, the due uh, start of that element of business, and it was given to the clerk a few minutes later. But I know that they have endeavoured to try and provide us with a heads up, just on the basis that. On behalf of the committee, we do get to ask a question in relation to our deliberations on matters, uh, and if we have the heads up of the statement, we can find out what it is that they're going to be discussing and whether or not we need to ask questions. In terms of the historical institutional abuse, the, we had discussed that with the um, First and Deputy First Minister, and they've informed us that the public appointment process for the Commissioner for Survivors of Institutional Childhood Abuse is underway and that it is anticipated that the Commissioner will be appointed in late summer. And I think all members are in agreement that we want to see that concluded as swiftly as possible and with no delay. And that is not a slight on anybody. It's just that we want to see a fully-fledged Commissioner that has all the powers that go with the Commissioner being able to advocate on behalf of everybody. Um, so just to make that point. And in terms of languages, the officials continue to do with their preparatory work to legislate for core elements of the rights, language and identity proposals contained in the new decade, new approach agreement, and the legislation will be uh, progressed during 2020 and 2021 as the operation of the Assembly and available resources permit during the COVID-19 crisis. So they indicated that there's been a slight delay because their attention has been on coronavirus, but it's hoped that if uh, they can get moving back, they will deliver that as soon as they can. Uh, on the basis of that piece of information and correspondence, are members content to note? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, item 6.2 to 6.4 are on pages 35 to 42 of the meeting pack of responses from the Executive Office to issues raised by the committee. Most are retained, but is there any issues there that members wish to raise? Okay. Item. Um, 6.9 at 130 of the meeting pack is a raised briefing note on the Northern Ireland multiple deprivation measures. Uh, we had discussed this back on the 13th of May and commissioned that piece of research from RAISE, but they have passed back this just an example. They've given us the example of um, Tokmona. Uh, to illustrate how the multiple deprivations is area-based rather than household-based, but they've said that they're going to come back to us with the wider research. So our members happy to content and content to note what is in there. Okay, uh, our members content to note the remaining items of correspondence. Okay, um, I have no chairman's business, which is item seven, item eight. Is there any other business? Then item nine is the date, time and place of next meeting. And for members to note that that will be next Wednesday, the 10th of June at two o'clock in this room. So members, thank you very much indeed for your patience. And thank you, Chair. Thank, thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.